A warm welcome to you for our second event celebrating the centenary of the Department of Material Science and Metallurgy. The history of our department can be traced back to the generous donation of the Worshipful Company of Goldsmiths that resulted in the opening of a laboratory dedicated to the study of metallurgy on the 5th of October 1920. My name is Ruth Cameron and as joint head of department it's a real pleasure to be able to welcome you all here today to participate in another event exploring the impact of our department and its researchers. Today's speakers are Professor Sir Harry Badisha, Tata Steele uh, Professor of Metallurgy, we've got Professor Zoe Barber and we've got Joe Smith. Professor Badisha is a world-renowned expert on the physical metallurgy of steels. Professor Barber is a world expert in thin film deposition and a member of our device materials group, and both have been extensively involved in university teaching. Joe Smith from Maudlin College is a master's student in the department and last year was a winner of the Worshipful Company of Armourers and Braziers Departmental Prize. Thank you, Ruth. So we are this year celebrating the department's 100th anniversary from its initial creation within the Department of Chemistry. And the story really begins with Charles Haycock, who was elected to a fellowship of the Royal Society in 1895. And that was just 15 years after he took the Natural Sciences Tripos at Cambridge. His work, which was based in the small laboratory in Sydney Sussex College, attracted the attention of the Goldsmiths Company, which endowed a readership in metallurgy at Cambridge and the Goldsmiths Laboratory of Metallurgy. Harry, did Haycock, who initiated metallurgy in Cambridge, write any books? Uh, no, in fact, he didn't. But he did inspire Ulick Evans, who was studying for the Natural Sciences Tripos in 1909, and was fortunate to be supervised by Haycock, who enthused him about uh, metals and alloys. And this led to his interest in um, electrochemistry, uh, electrochemistry of metals. Uh, but his work was uh, interrupted by the First World War. Uh, when he returned to civilian life, he began his uh, famous studies on corrosion, um, which were to last for 60 years. He often referred to corrosion as the unmaking of metals. Now, he was given access uh, to the Goldsmiths Laboratory by Haycock, and he was welcomed into the Laboratory of Physical Chemistry by Professor Lowry. And when the Goldsmiths Chair and Department of Metallurgy were subsequently established, each holder of that chair counted it as a great privilege to provide Evans with facilities. So this is how science worked in the old days. You know, the head of department actually provided all the facilities. Yes, and it explains why the head of department is always acknowledged uh, uh, for the provision of laboratory facilities in older papers from the department. That's right. So the first book uh, ever to emerge uh, from the Department uh, of Metallurgy was by Evans. And uh, this is just volume one of a four volume set that he published in 1923. And even now, it's quite fascinating to read because, you know, it contains, for example, um, information about the colloidal state of metals and the precipitation of one colloid from another. And bearing in mind that this was uh, written just um, 10 years after the Bragg law was discovered, it really is an amazing uh, piece of work. And the other three volumes systematically go through uh, the periodic table uh, as far as metals are concerned in the sequence uh, that existed in those days. Um, now, when he wrote uh, these books, uh, he realized that um, the subject of corrosion and oxidation was very badly understood in those days. You know, people used to think that corrosion is similar to putting a piece of metal into acid and it would dissolve. And uh, Evans was the first person, uh, well, one of two people in the world who believed that corrosion had an electrochemical basis. Uh, the other one was Wustenberg. So, you know, uh, we do experiments in schools where we put a droplet of uh, water on a piece of steel and the droplet is laced with phenothalin and uh, ferricyanide. So you get red and blue colors for the anodic and cathodic regions. And that is the key feature uh, that uh, Evans actually published in his next book, which was in 1924, uh, the um, 
uh, corrosion of metals and established the electrochemical basis for corrosion uh, originally and first published in this book. Now, Evans obviously was a great scientist. You know, he contributed for 60 years, actually. Uh, but he was also, he also had a life outside of his science. Uh, he was very fit and he swam in the river camp, for example, and enjoyed climbing. And legend has it that he narrowly missed taking part in an expedition to the Himalayas. And his final book was published in uh, 1964 with the amazing, uh, uh, wonderful title, Outdoor Activities, Memories Selected for Amusement Rather Than Achievement. And you, know, you can find this book in King's College Library if anybody wants to have a look at it. Mm. And wasn't John Chilton, who became a lecturer in our department, one of his PhD students? Yes, indeed he was. Uh, and uh, he wrote uh, The Principles of uh, Metallic Corrosion, which was published by the Royal Institute of Chemistry uh, in a series of monographs designed for teachers. So John's book was uh, number four in that series. And he was a wonderful teacher. You know, I've experienced him myself. And his Charles Beatty lecture at the Royal Society of Arts, uh, which is available on the internet, is an exemplar of science communication for a broad audience. At a time, you know, when there were no courses on how to communicate your work to a general public. So he was a brilliant teacher. Uh, Dr. Evans was obviously a great scientist who enjoyed science and life at the same time. Um, some of the books I've come across uh, are by Alan Cottrell, uh, his yield point effect describing, uh, described in the theoretical structural metallurgy still forms the basis of teaching when it comes to the stress strain curve. Uh, what's the story there? Okay, so that particular book uh, happened during the winter, just after the Second World War, when Cottrell had to work from home, rather like we are doing right now, um, because there was a national fuel shortage, which meant uh, that you couldn't do any experiments uh, or have heating at the University of Birmingham, where he was then based. So this isolation uh, led to the famous theory of the yield point effect, due to the anchoring of dislocations and culminating in the classic book published in 1948. When later he joined Cambridge as the Goldsmiths uh, professor, he was asked to publish a second edition, but he decided instead uh, that there was a good case for writing an elementary but specialized book uh, on a, a book which illustrates the triumph of metallurgy. So in 1966, uh, he published uh, Introduction to Metallurgy. So this is a book that I bought as an undergraduate and it's actually a signed, signed copy. Uh, so I got Alan Cottrell to sign it uh, when I joined the department uh, back in a uh, long time ago, <laughs> okay? So uh, this book uh, actually is published by the same publisher, Edward Arnold, as Uli Cavans' first book. And a part of the content reflects uh, Alan Cottrell's lectures on extraction metallurgy to the part 1B class. And the late Brian uh, Ralph once told me that the secret aim was to cover the entire syllabus of the 1B metallurgy course, which he manages to do actually. So this might be the first book ever written to cover an entire course. Uh, in his own words, it's a complete survey of the met metallurgical field. And uh, it's uh, interesting that uh, later on when I was the books editor for the Institute of Materials along with uh, Mark Hull and Peter Dankwoods, uh, we asked Cottrell to do a second edition, uh, which means that the book still is available in print. Yeah, the cover of the second edition was from George Smith, I believe, and his co-workers at Oxford, uh, a direct image of those cultural atmospheres of carbon atoms around the dislocation line in steel. Uh, not surprising, but nevertheless remarkable to actually see the carbon confined to the strain field with the dislocation. So you're, you're quite right. You know, Cottrell did not think that the response of matter to stimuli could be understood without uh, atomistic principles. So in 1960, 64, he published uh, this book, which is the Mechanical Properties of Matter. If you look closely, 
there's an image there uh, with, in which each dot represents an atom. And uh, this particular image was taken in our department um, uh, showing the atomic structure of uh, tungsten and was taken by Ranganathan. And it was Cottrell who actually initiated the field ion microscopy group in the department because uh, as, as he explains in the preface, you know, um, you really need to understand uh, structure at an atomic level to explain many of the properties that we see, not just mechanical, but physical properties as well. And of course, Chris Pickard is now the Cottrell professor and he also works on atomistic methods. Um, given that engineers deal with much greater scales, did Cottrell have any reservations about these methods? Yeah, so let me just comment on Chris first because he, along with Mike Payne, developed uh, CASTEP, which is a computer code that is now standard for atomic, atomistic calculations. Uh, so for example, if I wanted to explore uh, a hypothetical structure uh, such as uh, iron in the diamond arrangement of atoms, I could do that with that software and work out whether you know, it's even slightly likely that I could create it uh, on Earth. Um, so it's a very powerful uh, piece of software which is used all over the world. Uh, coming back to Cotter's uh, reservations, I recall a meeting in London which he organized with uh, Patty Four from Oxford on atomistic calculations, where he explained uh, that powerful as these methods are, they do not provide insight or deal adequately with deviations from stoichiometry because you're limited to you know, a certain number of atoms to uh, cope with the computational load. So he began to write uh, books uh, on, on this subject. And one of those books is uh, The Chemical Bonding in Transition Metal Carbides. Uh, and he gave me a copy of this, uh, and this too is uh, inscribed by him. And in this book, uh, there is, um, there is a, an equation uh, showing the repulsion between uh, carbon atoms. So the idea of this book is that, you know, he wanted to do calculations uh, without using a computer. So he managed to collect uh, data on bond strengths and so forth and work out cohesive energies and the stabilities of uh, transition metal carbides. Uh, and the particular equation I'm referring to, I took that and I applied it for carbon atoms inside iron. And it worked pretty well uh, and was consistent with thermodynamic calculations. So a certain amount of semi-empiricism actually helps you to get intuition into why certain carbides are more stable than others, rather than just looking at cohesive energies. And he went further, you know, he published uh, the book on concepts in electron theory. Uh, this was the last book uh, that he published. And in fact, uh, Jeff Cottrell, uh, his son, who is uh, a plasma physicist and uh, an amateur astronomer, uh, set up uh, Alan Cottrell's computer so that he could dictate this book into the computer at the time. So uh, in this book, he tries to explain electron theory, the theory that goes behind the computations in a very simple and elegant way. And in fact, he gave a course in our department using, using this book. So, there, um, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, are there any other books other than Cottrell's Introduction to Metallurgy that cover an entire course? Yes, um, so with EPSRC support, um, Harry and I developed a one-year master's course on materials modeling, and this led to the textbook Introduction to Materials Modeling, which I've got here. That was published in, in 2005. Um, and it was unique, really, in that it covered the whole range of modeling scales from atomic to engineering scale. And it's, it's remained a routine part of the undergraduate curriculum where the book continues to be very much used. And I think it's worth noting that the, the content of this book remains extremely relevant. It, it's a kind of fundamental text which really hasn't gone out of date. Yeah, and you know, there are other books that uh, Cottrell wrote. Uh, perhaps the most notable one is, you know, how safe uh, is nuclear energy? Because uh, there was a period where uh, there was quite a lot of uninformed discussion and uh, phrases like, uh, 
the malignant growth of nuclear power stations uh, and uh, how safe is radiation and so on. And Cottrell deals with all of that uh, in this book in a very readable manner. Uh, and, you know, he actually had a seminal role uh, in ensuring the safe operation of nuclear plant for energy generation. So this is a valuable contribution uh, to, if you like, set the record uh, right in an honest way, which presents the pros and cons of the whole subject. Alan Cottrell was followed by Robert Honeycomb as the Goldsmiths Professor in 1966. And he was head of department for more than 18 years. He was head of department when I arrived. Um, during that time, Honeycomb published two books, The Plastic Deformation of Metals and Steels. Uh, both yes. of these books cover uh, structural property relationships, which seem really to be the essence of material science. And uh, the Steels book forms the basis of uh, part three course with the same title. What's the story behind this book? Yeah, so that's a, there's a really interesting story, actually. Um, the Steele's book was supposed to be written by uh, David Edmonds and uh, Professor Honeycomb, but David was uh, on a Royal Society Research Fellowship, and someone at the Royal Society suggested that he should be focusing on research, so he had to drop out. Uh, Honeycomb completed the book, and he asked uh, various members of uh, his research group, which was known as the Steel Group, to comment on specific chapters. And I was asked to look at the chapters on martensite and bayonet. But at the time, we disagreed on the mechanism, the choreography of atoms during the bayonet transformation. So I commented only on the chapter on martensite. And bear in mind, you know, that I had just completed my PhD in his group and yet he respected my views, you know, a perfect example, if ever one was needed of the quality of academic freedom in Cambridge, and I'm sure in other places as well. Now, I do remember a pleasant discussion uh, where he joked that, uh, you know, if I went down alleyways, then I was likely to get mugged. So how did you come to be the co-author of the second edition of Steele's? Well, uh, you know, by that time I had published uh, my own book, uh, Bay Night in Steels, and I gave him a copy. I gave Honeycomb a copy. He studied it and he was apparently convinced and uh, told me that I had a free reign to change the chapter on Bay Night and to add uh, three more chapters and do a general revision of the whole book. Uh, the book is now in its uh, fourth edition with translations in Korean, Malay, and the traditional Chinese languages. So, for example, this is the Malay version, where Kaluli means uh, steel in the Malay language. Um, what prompted you to write the Bainite book as opposed to continuing to publish papers on the subject? So when I started research, uh, the subject was in utter confusion, you know, with heated, uh, largely unconstructive and quite lazy debates in the literature. So I felt there was a need to present a coherent picture uh, that is consistent with all of the available evidence. Uh, the third edition has this year been uh, translated into the Chinese language uh, by my wonderful colleagues at uh, Yanshan University, uh, Zainan uh, Yang and Fu Cheng Zhang. Now, Zainan was a visiting scientist in my group, uh, illustrating nicely how events, you know, conspire to lead to scholarship because the amount of work involved in translating, uh, you know, something like a 650 page book is just enormous. Uh, even the figure captions have been translated. Now, let me add that in the same series as uh, Steele's book, uh, Ian Hutchins in our department, he wrote uh, a really nice uh, book on tribology covering uh, the friction and wear of engineering materials. And this is my uh, cherished uh, signed copy that I refer to today in my research on the wear of steels and in particular impact wear of abrasion resistant uh, steels. Turning now to John Knott 
who was in 1966 and apparently out of the blue invited by Professor Honeycomb to come to Cambridge from the Central Electricity Research Laboratories. His book, Worked Examples in Fraction Mechanics, is a, an excellent illustration of a text intended for teaching, but which is also a perfect resource for researchers. But before that, he published Fundamentals of Fracture Mechanics, which begins with a quote from Boris Pasternak's Dr. Zhivago, in which, in which Antipov complains about the failure of rails in cold weather. That's right. Uh, well, John was a, a special person. Uh, he had a, a deep knowledge of many aspects of metallurgy. And in particular, you know, he understood more than most that the study of microscopic mechanisms must be accompanied by uh, quantitative methods that allow engineers to design safe structures. So this uh, attitude actually served society very well when for many years he was on the independent technical advisory group on structural integrity, uh, uh, commonly known as TEGSI, in the context of nuclear safety. And he was there at the foundation of uh, TEGSI and he served as its chairman for seven years. Uh, so he did an enormous amount of very detailed work to check that uh, you know, the structural integrity of nuclear pressure vessels and other components uh, are safely calculated. Now, this book uh, on uh, fracture mechanics is necessarily heavy on uh, mathematics, uh, but it's written uh, in a manner where the concepts are clear even on a first reading. So he made an effort to uh, suggest different pathways to the book so that uh, you could skip some of the difficult parts and focus on the essence of the subject. And you know, I think that is quite important uh, uh, so that uh, the book does not pose an insurmountable uh, challenge to uh, many of the readers. And those who want to go into detail can of course do so. Didn't you write a book in the Worked Examples series for the Institute of Mexico? Oops, sorry, my pile of books just fell down. <laughs> okay, uh, can you ask again? <laughs> Uh, yes, I was just saying, didn't you also write a, a worked examples book for the uh, Institute of Metals? Yes, uh, that's right. Uh, so that was the, uh, in 1987, uh, worked examples in the geometry of uh, crystals. Uh, but, you know, this is, uh, this was for a graduate course that I, I gave in the department. And it deals more with uh, the mathematical handling of uh, orientations, deformations, interfaces, and phase transformations, solid state phase transformations. It basically assumes that you have a working uh, knowledge of crystals. Uh, and uh, both John Knott and uh, Jack Christian in Oxford uh, commented on this uh, to help me to improve the draft and uh, duly acknowledged. But you know, the interesting thing is that uh, when I taught the course, um, it helped to clarify many aspects which I took for granted during research. Uh, but which I found I did not fully understand until I was challenged by students. So that's one of the advantages of, uh, you know, giving a course and writing a book on the subject. Uh, that particular course now no longer exists, but uh, you continue to teach crystallography now to undergraduates. Uh, that's right. Uh, so um, recently uh, I published uh, a much uh, expanded uh, version to cover the latest developments in the mathematical methods and included nine additional chapters to cover also the elements of crystallography. So you, uh, you know, undergraduates can basically ignore what comes after nine chapters if they wish to, or they can be inspired by them. That's the logic uh, of this particular book. Uh, and I've taught uh, crystallography to the part two class for a number of years. And if you look in here, you know, you remember many of the things that uh, we discussed at the time. And there are so many materials already available today and claims about how the latest discovery is going to change the world as we know it. Uh, how are undergraduates expected to make reasoned arguments and appropriate choices for better design? Um, what's the university done to address this difficulty? I think that's a very important question, especially in uh, today's, uh, today's world. Uh, and there, there are two things uh, that have happened in the university um, which stand out. So Jim Charles, uh, who was a wonderful teacher, 
in our department, uh, but was also well versed uh, with industry. You know, he started his career in the British Oxygen Company. He wrote uh, the book, uh, Selection and Use of Engineering Materials, which is now in its uh, third edition. And the book correctly emphasizes the need to consider a bank of properties. Uh, and you know, to paraphrase a colleague, uh, Dan Miracle, uh, there is much work between measuring a single attractive property to demonstrating its credibility in a particular application. You know, very often claims are made about the wonder of a material by just focusing on a single property, uh, which doesn't actually help to design a component. Uh, so along with Jim's book, we now have the Granta software created by Mike Ashby and his team. Uh, and Mike Ashby uh, was actually an undergraduate in our department, and he did his PhD in our department under uh, Jerry Smith, uh, the late Jerry Smith. So if you combine Jim's book and the software, then we have a winning combination. Now, I'd like to add that, you know, Mike Ashby is uh, a renowned author in his own right. He's written many, many books, but unfortunately he wrote them while he was in the engineering department. So we're not going to cover them today. Uh, there is another book that uh, Jim Charles uh, wrote, and this time with uh, Lindsay Greer, and it's called uh, Light Blue Materials. It's a very interesting book. Uh, it covers the history of the department all the way from 1920 to 2005 when it was published. And Jim Charles also published uh, a biography, and, uh, an autobiography, um, Jim, uh, uh, his book was called Out of the Fiery Furnished uh, Recollections and Meditations of a Metallurgist. Uh, now, it's a very personal book, but it makes interesting reading because, you know, it contains a mixture of metallurgy and his particular way of dealing with it. He continued uh, to write books and there's a further one known as One Man's Cambridge, which is even more personal covering his uh, father's life and achievements. So you mentioned uh, Lindsay Greer there. Lindsay, of course, also features through the book with Ken Kelton on nucleation in the condensed state. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, this is a book. Uh, this is the book, and uh, it's about seven hundred and thirty pages. It's really the most comprehensive treatment on the subject, and you know it doesn't neglect the complexities that arise during nucleation. For example, you know when the treatment of very small clusters of atoms and the meaning of an interface on that scale, all that is covered, and. Uh, the book is uh, dedicated to uh, David Turnbull, with whom uh, Ken and Lindsay worked at Harvard when Lindsay was on a NATO fellowship at Harvard University, and uh, also dedicated to Robert Kahn from our department, who inspired them to write, uh, write this book in his capacity as the inaugural editor of a new series for Pergamon. I am certain that the book uh, represents um, the standard in the subject. And it took 19 years to write, okay, 19 years. And a number of Lindsay's colleagues lost money because they bet that the book would never be completed. So that brings us nicely to Robert Kahn, who was responsible for the publication of many, many edited books after he was welcomed back to the department in which he'd been an undergraduate. Yeah, so uh, of course uh, he is very famous for vast volumes of edited uh, uh, books, but he also wrote two by himself. Uh, so this is um, uh, Artifice and Artifacts, which contains a uh, hundred essays on material science. Uh, it's an adaptation of articles uh, that he wrote for Nature and other journals covering a vast range of subjects. For example, uh, how to detect fraud in the labeling of wine. You know, he was quite a character. Uh, the second one, uh, The Art of Belonging uh, memoir is more personal, almost a biography describing uh, this grand old man of science, our own grand old man of science. 
And as I pointed out for Uli Evans, there are actually a number of books like this uh, that illustrate uh, the person behind the exceptional science. So Colin Humphreys, for example, uh, at a ripe old age, uh, published uh, a paper on three-dimensional graphene and has gone on to uh, create a company which has probably marketed the first ever viable electronic device made from graphene, the uh, thinnest and smallest Hall effect sensor, which is due to be installed uh, during the refurbishment of kilometers of uh, the CERN synchrotron. Now, at the same time, he found time to write two books on the interpretation of events in the Bible, uh, the miracles of Exodus and the mystery of the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. So moving topic now um, to liquid crystalline polymers. Harry, in the early days, this appeared to be a strange contradiction of spatial order, fluidity, and large molecular weight. But nevertheless, we have the solidified form Kevlar, which is now almost a household name. Tell us about the book by Athene Donald and Alan Windle. Yeah, so uh, Athene was actually in our department as a Science and Engineering Research Council. Today we call it APSERC. Uh, so she was an SCRC fellow for three years uh, before joining the Cavendish Laboratory. And Ellen Mindel, of course, had been in the department for some time covering uh, the uh, general area of polymers. Now, when they worked together on specific aspects of uh, liquid crystal polymers, they were surprised to find that there was no dedicated text on the subject. Uh, so they wrote Liquid Crystalline Polymers, which was published in 1992, uh, as a complete story all the way from history to the sort of uh, detail which would inspire the reader. And there was a later second edition published with Simon Hanna, who, who was also from our department and now is a professor in Bristol University. So could Athene be the first female book author from the department? I think that is right. You know, although she was based at the Cavendish when the book was published, her liquid crystal polymers work originated from our department. And of course, uh, she went on to achieve much more in uh, so soft metaphysics with Sam Edwards at the Cavendish. And you might be interested that she writes uh, a well-researched blog on a variety of uh, topics, um, occasionally delving into the trials and tribulations of being a scientist. And now to crystallography. Um, the department has a, a reputation for rigor in its teaching of this subject and almost half a century of teaching collaboration with the Earth Sciences Department. I suppose it's not surprising that there have been a number of crystallography books published. Indeed, we, we now have the book by uh, Kevin Knowles and Tony Kelly, now in its third edition. And I have the um, second edition here. This is, this is my copy, so. Excellent. Uh, the first edition was by Kelly and Gross. Uh, and when Tony Kelly uh, came back to our department, he and Kevin uh, connected because they both have a reputation for meticulous attention to detail. And, uh, there is another connection that Kevin was actually supervised for his DPhil in Oxford by David Smith, who in turn had done his PhD work with Kelly. So there is another clear connection here. And the book on metal matrix composites by Bill Klein and Phil Withers has the title Introduction to Metal Matrix Composites, but is in fact a comprehensive treatment of value to both undergraduates and researchers. Are there others that Bill has published? Uh, yes, uh, the uh, book Introduction to Composite Materials with uh, Derek Hull, who was the Goldsmiths Professor after Honeycomb. Uh, so this has become uh, one of the standard books in the teaching of composites. And uh, the latest edition explains, for example, why graphene polymer composites are ineffective. Now, let me ask you a question, Joe, just to uh, get your view on books. So can you, as a current undergraduate, uh, give an opinion on the utility of writing books? 
in this day of the internet and uh, electronic access, online access to all sorts of knowledge, is it a worthwhile thing to do given the enormous effort involved in writing books? I definitely still think it is. Um, from what I've seen, books both help to define a subject where there's often uh, a large mass of disorganized knowledge uh, and also present a coherent, uh, often big picture assessment where, where um, whether that's for teaching or research. Um, but certainly it seems that books today have been made much more accessible by the internet and this can only be a good thing. And I think the effort involved in writing a book is worthwhile, even if it clarifies the subject for, for the author alone. Um, but also by discovering inconsistencies, the process can even generate research. And the fact that some more recent books are backed by snippets of online software, particularly that included in Do It Poms, uh, is incredibly helpful in really deciding whether we understand what we read and in making topics interactive for learners. Yeah, I think uh, there are also other benefits. Uh, so uh, this book, uh, for example, uh, is hot off the press, uh, Innovations in Everyday Engineering Materials, written with uh, Tarashankar Debroy at uh, Penn State University. And here's uh, another one, which was rushed over by the publishers uh, for this event, uh, Theory of Transformations in Steels. Now, um, when the first hard copy arrives, okay, uh, there is a stunning sensation of joy. And you know, the word stunning actually, uh, word stun actually means to incapacitate. So you're not able to actually do anything useful for the next few days after staring at the hard copy of the book. And for a microsecond, you feel that you're in the company of J.K. Rowling's or Chinua Achebe. And you have to remember, you know, a microsecond is a long period of time. It is a thousand times as long as a nanosecond. So thank you all for listening. And it's now time for questions and answers. Okay. Um, I don't seem to be able to turn my video on for a minute. I think the, uh, the, the people in charge of the uh, Zoom call can perhaps um, bring that on for me in a second. But can you hear me? Oh, here we go. Yes. I think I can now start my video. Fantastic. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> so thank you very, very much to all three of you. That was an absolutely fascinating um, uh, whiz through uh, uh, 100 years of books, uh, a whole century of, of, of work going on there. We've got some questions already, uh, but I would encourage everybody in the audience to, to type your questions into the chat. Uh, we've got some time um, to, to get our panel's views on, on these questions. Um, so let's um, start with, with a question for Harry to begin with. Um, uh, and this is from uh, Ananth, who says, um, it's a very impressive journey towards book writing, but um, how did you get into the discipline of putting together all your thoughts into a book? Um, they say they've been trying to put uh, together their thoughts for a long time into a book, but it doesn't seem to be moving forward. What, what are your, what's your advice? I think, I think um, the first book uh, basically came from teaching and uh, in teaching, you know, you have to actually learn things which are not in your area of expertise. So you're forced to actually learn things and put them down in a logical order for the students to appreciate. So that's how the first book that I wrote came about. And the second book really came about uh, from intense irritation at the state of the subject. So there is a strong motivation to do something useful and to present a coherent picture. But you are, of course, doing many other things at the same time. So, for example, Lindsay Greer's book took 19 years to write, and he went through being head of department for seven years and his research group and all the rest of it. So it is something that's worthwhile, but it's not for the faint-hearted. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Abmir Shiradzi is saying, is it true that, the, that Cotterall predicted the existence of dislocations well before TEM proved the existence of his theories? And his second question is, um, how do you see the future of metallurgy and materials in the department, um, as it seems that, that fewer people are researching material, uh, metallurgy these days in, in materials departments? So, is that addressed to me? Um, let's start with the Cotterall prediction of the existence of dislocations. So, 
uh, is, is that something that you want to come into? Yeah, so, so it wasn't actually Cottrell who predicted the existence of uh, dislocations, but you go back to Taylor and uh, all, all those people in, in the physics uh, department, Cavendish and so forth. And even uh, going back to the 18th century, you know, Volterra had the operations which described the displacements uh, due to uh, various kinds of uh, cylinders being cut and then joined together. Yeah, so um, Cottrell's uh, theory of st uh, structural metallurgy was actually a beautiful compilation of dislocation theory. And of course, uh, you know, he, he contributed to things like Loma Cottrell locks and uh, the strain fields around dislocations. Elizabeth Yoffe, who was in our department actually, she was the first to calculate the strain fields around dislocations, you know, using uh, elasticity theory. Uh, what was the second question? It was about the future of metallurgy um, as opposed to more general material science. Have you got any comments yeah. on that? So it's never a good idea to predict the future or, or to try and change the past. Uh, that's my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> very, very wise, very wise. So I think this next question is probably for uh, everybody. Uh, so maybe starting with Zoe. So uh, which of the books discussed would you take to your uh, desert island? Oh. <laughs> I, I, I think probably a crystallography book because you can, there's it's meaty stuff there, and I, I've always, I mean, it's what why I'm 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 still around. I I, I started natural sciences thinking I was going to be a physicist, and I like many people discovered materials through the first year crystallography courses, which just appealed from the sort of solving clues, crossword solving um, point of view. I I always say. Um, I, I find it very, very satisfying, and it, it, there's just so much there. You can keep delving in, into crystallography and find more and more, um, I, I think. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Joe? Oh, I hate, I hate to copy uh, Zoe, but um, I, 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 I was thinking, um, certainly the book I've used most um, recently is, is one that I currently have in my room back at college, which is Harry's work, worked examples on the geometry of crystals. Um, and similarly, so sorry, I just find that uh, crystallography is an incredibly satisfying um, subject to look at because it, 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 it reduces down a lot of these problems to wonderful ideal problems that you can look at from a, a very logical point of view. So um, in the preface of this book, I actually put down uh, the book that I would like to take if I were to be abandoned on a deserted island. And the book is actually this one. You can see how used it is, okay? And bedraggled. And it's the theory of transformations in metals and alloys by Jack Christian from Oxford, which is an absolutely amazing book. Uh, you know, it has, uh, it's so beautifully written, concise, and yet, uh, you have to read it several times to understand it because of its conciseness. So I spent a whole sabbatical actually reading this book a uh, long time ago. Thank you. Uh, so some recommendations there for people for, for, um, for bedtime reading to, to get, get into, the, into the subject. Um, a question for Harry um, from Hongbao Dong. Uh, if the research field is not established yet, when would be a good time to write a book to introduce the field uh, while the field is still developing? Mm. So most, most people would argue that uh, the best, initially there should be reviews because if the subject is changing rapidly, then you're likely to have your book out of date uh, very quickly. So uh, I would suggest that, you know, uh, Writing reviews is a good thing. And these days you can publish very large reviews in journals like Progress in Material Science, uh, 100 pages, 200 pages, et cetera. Okay. Um, so um, I think a question perhaps for um, Zoe next. Uh, I'm just finding my uh, list of questions here again. Um, do you think universities encourage academics enough to write books or are universities um, not really giving uh, academic space to do that? Well, clearly I don't have experience of, of other universities. I, I guess there's encouragement from the point of view of, of output. We're always um, encouraged to um, have uh, quantifiable outputs. I, I fear 
that there isn't enough time. And um, as I think Harry has said, it really does take a lot of focused effort and it's very, very difficult. I, I've, I've had, um, I've been approached with, you know, ideas from publishers, write a book on thin film deposition, thin film growth, and I'd love to do it, but it, it's, a, it's a huge body of work to do properly and to do well. So I, I think the answer is, is probably that there's discouragement from the point of view of just not having enough hours in the day. Some, some brilliant people can do it, Harry can do it, but um, <laughs> many of us um, just haven't, haven't got the, the sort of energy to, to do so. Um, so I guess related to that, um, Colin Humphreys is saying, uh, he said, great interview. Um, he says, um, what's your technique for writing books, Harry? What, do you write every day? Do you write at a set time? How, how, do you, um, how do you make yourself do it? So in my later years, I actually learned from Colin Humphreys uh, <laughs> that the best time to write is early in the morning. You know, you get up at around six o'clock in the morning and spend uh, a couple of hours uh, doing, doing the work. But um, it cannot be every day because many other things uh, get in the way. So um, if, it, if the subject interests you sufficiently, then you'll make progress over a period of a couple of years or so. But the early morning period, I find, is very productive. Awesome. Some hints for us all there. Um, so this one's possibly for, for, for Joe. The, um, uh, in, John Spear says, in, in the USA, there seems to be a trend where university textbooks are quite costly and the students are trying to avoid purchasing them, which then um, drives the community to find free alternatives to books. Is this also happening in the UK? And are there any clear implications for education and book publishing? It's a, it's a broad question. What, what are your thoughts? Um, I think certainly from what I've seen, the books in the UK are nowhere near as expensive as those in the US. Um, but also I haven't had to purchase any books for my studies, even where they've been recommended. Um, so mostly I rely on, on sort of a, a college library or departmental libraries that have all the textbooks I'd ever need um, and sufficient copies of them. Um, and alongside that, the, the Cambridge courses are usually fairly self-contained. And so the, the books are um, actually quite difficult to, to fit into your schedule to read around all the other work you have and are usually kept for uh, the vacations if you sort of want to have a read of it. So kind of related to that, um, do it, it's perhaps for everybody, but do, do your students use the textbooks in paper form or, format or digital? Uh, so the person asking the question is saying, personally, they prefer a paper-based book rather than uh, having it on a screen. But uh, so, so Joe, do you have a preference for uh, seeing it on a screen or holding it in it's, your hand? It's certainly very paradoxical because um, everything points towards electronic books being better. I can carry thousands on one device and uh, they are much more compact. Um, and often cheaper as well. Um, however, there really is some lovely feeling about having uh, a paper book that will always drive me to get the paper book if I can. But certainly in the last year, the availability of electronic books has been fantastic while we haven't had access to, to libraries. That's, that's very true. H Harry, do you like having it in your hand or? Yeah, so I, I think it depends. You know, if you, if you need to study something in great detail, then the electronic version doesn't work. Uh, the electronic mm -hmm. version often is where you want to get snippets of information. But if you want to go through the whole book systematically, mm -hmm. then I think there's nothing to beat a uh, paper copy. I think so also you can, you can have them on, on your bookshelves and, and come back to it and remember it. Whereas if it's filed away on the computer, uh, you, you'll maybe forget it's there. Um, it, it's it's lovely the idea that you just sort of pass a book and think oh yes I remember that and can look something up or something like that. So um, perhaps for Joe this one what what books should be written to attract sixth formers into material science in the first place um, without them needing to actually accidentally stumble into it for example on the natural sciences tripos what what should be out there what should somebody write? That's a very good question um, and actually I might not even be the best person to ask now again because I've already discovered material science. Um, but certainly when I was applying to university, there was um, a sort of more popular science book that I read called Stuff Matters. 
um, that I know is very popular among people sort of preparing for a Cambridge interview to get an idea of um, what material science is like. Um, I still don't feel it, it completely gives you a sense because uh, I certainly didn't realise what materials was entirely like until I just did the first year course. Uh, and that's possibly because any book that is uh, tries to be amenable to, to a general reader necessarily doesn't co co uh, cover topics such as crystallography in the kinds of depths that I think makes them really interesting. Um, so I don't know, I think that is a, an open question, but I'd certainly be interested to see any, any possible solutions to it. We have our recommended books um, for the Tripos um, with, with the Stuff Matters, Mark Mudovnik, and also um, Gordon Structures, which was the, the classic um, for my generation to, to pull us into materials, I think. I'm, I'm nervous about crystallography textbooks, perhaps putting people off, but uh, um, despite what I said earlier. Um, so Zoe, um, this is a, a teaching question really, and it, it's, it's um, what distinguishes a good book for, for undergraduates from a comprehensive book? Um, what, what makes something um, really good as a, as a teaching text? Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, I, I guess I'm trying to think what, what's, what's the other side, what's the not the teaching text? Is that a text that's trying to attract readers without perhaps crossing the T's and dotting the I's, which is, is frustrating if it's, if it's an undergraduate text. I think an under, undergraduate text has, has to be complete and um, sort of justified. You, you, you can't get away with, with breezy statements ab about things. Um, um, but I um, can't think of anything else there. I don't know, I wonder, Harry, have you got a comment on that one? Well, I think the Open University does a really good job there. You know, so you, you have these uh, books which are not, uh, not very thick, but are so carefully put together that they explain the topic uh, incredible, with incredible clarity and yet they provide a level of challenge because you don't want a book which is just perfectly understandable. Otherwise, you know, it's like sport, you need a bit of uh, competition. So um, I think a book uh, like that would require a great deal of work, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with, with people looking at how it's going to work and focus groups and so on, which is what the Open University does extremely well. Uh, the other problem I think uh, in having a course book is we often change the course when we give it again. You know, uh, the course content is always changing. So in that respect, uh, a book would not uh, be helpful. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we're probably coming towards the, the end now. There, there are a lot of questions here that we haven't been able to, um, to, to come to. Um, but uh, we're being asked, is there a list of books <laughs> published? Um, Harry, would you like to, to comment? Yeah, from the department, you mean? Yeah. I guess, yes, yes. Yes, uh, so I, I've got all that ready and uh, our aim is to link that list to the video of this uh, presentation today, which will be available on the departments uh, and the university's YouTube channels. I think we're also trying to pull together a list, not a list, not just of the books that have been authored from the department, but those have been, that have been edited from the department as well. And uh, I think um, Kevin Knowles is, is uh, doing some sterling work in, in that area, too. So, we're, yes, we're pulling together that information. But the, the information from this this talk, you'll be putting on the website. Yes. Fantastic. Well, I think we'll draw it to a close there. Um, so uh, firstly, I should say thank you very much to Harry, Joe and uh, Zoe for the, that uh, really um, thoughtful presentation and to everybody here for, for joining. We've had a huge number of people here on the call and that's uh, it's been fantastic. Just shows the interest that we've got. I've heard, learned a huge amount from today's discussion. Um, again, I've been really struck by the contributions of our department over the years to um, leading the way and, and, and uh, defining the field of material science. Um, I think as researchers today, we often find ourselves focused on journal papers alone as a research output, but today has been uh, a fascinating demonstration of how the discipline of writing a book can be a way of drawing together ideas, 
Um, and please uh, continue to follow uh, the department for announcements regarding future events for our uh, centenary. So once again, a final thank you to our speakers and to you for attending uh, and we'll close there. Thank you. Thank you.